Hi, my name is Saurabh Sangvi, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And today, we're honored to have a great group of panelists. Uh, starting over there, we have Martin Wadenberg, Joe Ward, Ben Fry, and today our panel will be moderated by Sam Hinkey. Um, and so the panel will go until 11:10. Um, and uh, with that, I'll just like to hand it over to Sam. Thank you. Here you mic. Yeah, I'm good. All right, perfect. Welcome. Uh, we're excited about today. I think it should be fun. Seven years ago, uh, a few of us met in a basement in, on MIT's campus, and we talked about the role of analytics in sports and how it would be useful. Uh, when you fast forward to today, one of the bottlenecks we face isn't great analysis, it's communicating the results to a larger and larger audience. Data visualizations can help. That's our focus today and one of the things we're going to talk about uh, today. One of the leaders in this field, Ed Tufte, talks a lot about interface design and about how important it is to try to minimize the interface design so you can get directly to the content. Uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, for today's discussion, I am the interface design. And I will clearly be minimized very quickly, and we should get directly to the content. So we're going to jump right into it. I hope it'll be fun for you, because it's going to be quite interactive, and you'll see lots of examples of uh, good work out there. Uh, you'll see in, in the bios that were printed for everyone, uh, Martin heads up Google's data visualization group. Joe uh, is at the New York Times and is uh, legendary for some of his sports graphics. And Ben has his own uh, firm here in Boston, Fathom. I, I think it'll be really interesting for you. Uh, and we'll get started. So maybe to get us going, whoever wants to take it will be fine. Let's talk about uh, sports in general. Like, how can data visualization even help? Um, I'll take that one. OK. Um, I think you could do, when you're starting to design, um, I think you could do a lot worse than um, following the lead of uh, Steve Jobs, who said, start, start with um, the consumer and work backwards. So who are you designing for? If you're, gonna, if you're in sports analytics and you want to design, are you designing for the starting point guard or the general manager? It's a big difference. Um, so if you take this um, graphic, which was done by Craig Robinson, actually, of uh, Flip Flop Fly Ball, and, um, you could, I don't know if you can scroll down farther to see the bottom of it, but um, the legend down there is that the red is how often he was injured. So if this is for the general manager, he probably knows that, that um, Nick Johnson was injured a lot and didn't play, but if he's trying to make a decision on whether um, he wants to sign this guy, he might want to opt after looking at this chart, he might want to opt for somebody who's a little, more, a little bit more durable um, even though that guy might not have a big upside. If you, are, um, if you want to go to the Facebook one, um, if you're designing for a point guard, he's going to have to make decisions based on um, split second. You're going to have to make split second decisions. So you can't give him uh, lots of charts and numbers for him to digest. Um, but what you could do is give, something, give him something very visual. So if he, if he needs to go beyond the three-point line, to defend somebody, and there's like three guys you need to do that for, then you give them a picture of those three guys. But you don't give them a lot of charts about what their, what their three-point shooting is, you know, because in a split second, he's not going to be able to recall that. Uh, maybe the best place to go next is sort of other examples. One of the things you talked about was GMs in particular um, sort of trying to think about spend and winning and the relationship there. Ben, I think you might be able to tackle that uh, with some of the examples of the work you've done. The, uh, in, the baseball piece. Mm -hmm. uh, could we see the salary and performance uh, baseball piece? Where is there? Uh, he's in the back. Great. Um, so uh, a couple years ago, actually, just after the, actually it's not updating. Um, after the uh, Red Sox had won their, which maybe hit reloaded or something like that. It's not a. Oh. That's worse. <laughs> um, that's a little better. So uh, after the uh, Red Sox first won the um, World Series in uh, 2004, that it, just looking at sort of this idea of um, salary versus how teams actually do. You know, so um, the Red Sox were uh, not exactly an upstart at um, you know, the second highest uh, paid uh, team in baseball. 
Uh, but I was curious about kind of how that works out across different teams. And so built this, you know, sort of a simple graphic just looking at wins and losses on the left-hand side and uh, actual salaries on the right. And then basically, you've, if uh, you have a steep blue line, you're doing well. If you have a steep uh, red line, you kind of need to fire your general manager. Um, you can drag across the top of the screen and then it flips through the um, different days of the season. Unfortunately, that's not happening today. Um, but the, uh, that kind of stuck around for a bit, and so we started, um, you know, so it had begun as a, you know, six to eight hour hack to kind of look at what, the, what this relationship might be. Um, and then instead kind of uh, came back a bit later because folks were, um, you know, kept asking about it and wanting to see it updated uh, over seasons and added things like, you know, the proportional, uh, if you click that. Um, so here, you know, putting the wins and losses in proportion instead of just sort of uh, rank order. Um, if we click the average on the left-hand side and the proportional on the right-hand side, um, you know, just a scale where we show the, the win percentage. Um, you know, so this is, gives you a much clearer picture in terms of what's actually happening in the data, or if you click down at the bottom there, just separating things out so we can see National League versus uh, American League and get a little bit more perspective about how everything uh, fits. And also with, with it being interactive, that you know, it can do some subtle changes in terms of size and uh, layout, so it makes itself a little bit more readable by uh, expanding things like that. I, I think the panelists, um, or the, the folks at a conference like this, are, are in organizations you might describe as uh, attempting to be data-driven, right? Or sort of moving towards being data-driven. Martin, you work at Google, which is the epitome of data-driven, uh, yet, yet there's still investment in this area and something that uh, people find useful. Tell us about like, how that works and, and how a, a, a true data-driven organization thinks about visualization. Sure, yeah, I mean, one thing I should say right off is I can't speak for the whole organization because they're one of the you know, benefits of, of everyone buying into the value of data is that everyone is analyzing data separately in little different groups, people get together as well. And, but what I can say from the groups that I've seen is that there's sort of a, a set of stages that people go through in analyzing. It begins when there's someone who's just heavily into statistics and they'll sit there maybe you know, just looking at numbers by themselves. They often work out their own ways to get at the truth. It may even not involve data visualization. It could just involve doing a lot of math. But there comes a time when you have to talk to other people. And it could be other analysts. It could be um, talking to executives. And at that point, visualization always enters the equation. So one of the points that I would make about data visualization in general is it's an excellent way to communicate as well as analyze. Um, you know, it's a great way to support decisions, but it's also a really good way to argue about decisions. And in fact, much of my career has been trying to get people into arguments using visualization, because I feel like one of the benefits is when everyone can see the data in one place on the screen, you can really get very productive discussions about what's going on. So let's talk about that. I, I think most of the people here would say these are nice sort of eye candy, um, nice to have to put on your site or to put internally in your company to use. Like, where does the rubber meet the road? Like, where you can actually use these things? Like, what are examples we could look at where you could actually use these things to make decisions and to sort through, you know, big chunks of data that, that maybe our brains just aren't wired to, to sort of consume in, in other ways? So I have an interesting example of this that is going to seem out of left field, so to speak, and it has to do with baby names, but I'll explain the connection in a moment. So what you see here is an interactive visualization that I created to help my wife, who is a baby name expert, um, talk about baby names. Now, let's see, why don't we start by um, yeah, emptying it. What you see there is uh, several thousand time series. These are the history of baby names in the United States. Each, each one of those little stripes represents an individual name. Um, this is history of popularity from 1880 to the present. The thickness of a stripe tells you the popularity of the name. What's fun about this is you can interact with it very quickly. Um, so for example, let's type in Brady, just to pick a name at random. And let's look at its history. Oop, is that, oh, that's Mark. Uh, Brady, like Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> you can see a spike and kind of an interesting fall off, too, at the very end. Um, now, 
this was something that was launched you know, several years ago. And the thought was that only people who are just real enthusiasts about baby names would be interested in it. Um, and in fact, many people are sitting there trying to make a decision about, okay, what name should I name my baby, which can, you know, it's maybe not the same, it's a gajillion dollar trade you're considering, but to the people making that decision, it can feel like a super important thing. And one thing we discovered is that people were willing to spend hours and hours with this thing. They would talk to us about it, they would write in saying they chose their name this way. And it was really surprising to us because if you think about the structure of the data underlying this, it's thousands of time series. Um, and it feels very intimidating in other contexts. It's hard to get people to think about retirement planning and look at thousands of stocks. But there's something about this that was fun for them. Let's try typing a couple of other names just so you can see how this works. Um, anyone have a name they want to try, a kid's name, a name they're considering? What was that? <laughs> Eli, okay, so let's type E. So actually, let's stop there, E-L, is this? So already we can see that E-L names sort of were hugely popular, then dipped in the 50s, then came back into style. And then if we go back all, all the way to Eli, we can start to see, um, and then hit return to um, just single out Eli itself so we don't get Elizabeth. We can say, okay, that name is on the chart with a bullet. Um, that, that's that's a, a rising name. So whoever uh, picked that, super trendy. Um, so there's, you know, so one thing that turned out is that yes, this is good for analyzing data when you need to make a decision. Another interesting thing relates to group analysis, and I'll come back to this later, is that when this launched, people all over the web started analyzing the set of data, posting their conclusions on blogs, and it became this great catalyst for analysis that I think wouldn't have happened otherwise. Full disclosure, I used baby name Voyager to name our second son. Because um, we're geeky like that at our house. Um, you name him Eli or Brady? <laughs> neither. And we avoided Tyson. There was a big dip in yeah, Tyson. Tyson is good. When, yeah, he, Tyson. when he bit Holyfield's ear, baby name Voyager like spiked. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was it was a bad a bad time. Um, Joe, let's let's talk about maybe some of your work at the Times. This is clearly we, we were talking about like who's a leader in this field and. And I, I asked that question of oh, 75 or 80 people, and the Times was always the first name that we, that we got back. Uh, let's talk to us, maybe like your student debt example I thought was interesting of like how to like look at lots and lots of data in a way that, of course, we could put it in a table, but um, it's just so much harder to consume and filter through. Right, so um, this, this chart right here, you, you can, uh, type in the name of your school or a school you're considering, and then it might be able to tell you um, where you're, how much debt you're gonna have when, you're, when you um, uh, graduate. And so this is kind of a good tool to make decisions. Um, data, data really at the, at the end um, in, in a lot of corporations, it's about making decisions. Um, if you go to one of, those, one of those at the very top, it's um, on the right, I don't know if you, there's a California School of Art, and um, so you might want to consider, do you really want that much debt if you're going to be graduating with an art degree or art history degree? You may, but um, it's, it, it's really, um, you know, it's really kind of a, and, and what's great about this, I think, is that um, you can filter it different ways, and that's what I think is most important about large data sets, is you have to be able to filter them. and. Um, so too much data can really be overwhelming and like, where do I start, where do I go? But if you can, I think if you're gonna start designing this stuff, um, you really need to be able to filter it down and, and, and tell the narrative, tell the story that you wanna tell um, and try to get rid of everything else. What are, what are common mistakes that you see um, designers make or you know, sort of the, all the rage now is data scientists make as they try to make visualizations? I think the first thing that people um, like to do. If you can go to, um, uh, you go to the Heisman, please. Um, I think people use too much, try to use too much color. They have a lot of data and they think they need to give every data point a different color. And um, I think uh, a lot of, maybe a lot of questions people ask them is how much of this can I get away with? And I think a better question is how little of this can I get away with? Right, so if you could scroll down just a little bit, you can see all those lines that kind of look like colored spaghetti. And um, I, so I do think it's a little bit more difficult to follow that because, um, you know, there's lots of, all the colors are fighting against each other. Um, so 
if you go to uh, the Rodriguez one, what you could do is take each one of those Heisman players, which is, and, and the chart is how likely during those weeks that they, you know, how popular they were um, for winning the Heisman. If you go to the Rodriguez one, each one of those players could actually have his own little chart, um, and it would be highlighted against the rest of them. So for instance, this one, which is um, the pace at which uh, um, players were uh, hitting their home runs, um, if you can see on the right that there's a lot of spaghetti there, but a lot of the spaghetti doesn't have color. And so you, you want to, you know, take, um, you want to be able to compare two guys. I want to compare Rodriguez to Barry Bonds. And so you get rid of the rest of the guys. And then when it's time to talk about Hank Aaron, then you get rid of the other guys. So instead of putting them all together on the same chart and everything fighting with each other, sometimes it's better to have small multiples, which is uh, an Edward Tufte favorite. Um, and if you very quickly go to uh, Jeter, um, this chart was an entire page. And on the entire page, there's really only um, one highlight color. And so everything is really blue and gray, and it's sort of uh, nothing is fighting with any, anything. And the only highlight color, if you could zoom in to the, the chart on the left, the only highlight color is that orange. Um, and that shows the, um, the season in which the player hit his 3,000th, got his 3,000th hit. And if you go down that, you can follow that down, and you'll see that Pete Rose is the only guy who got to 3,000 faster than Derek Jeter. So you wanna, what is the story you want to tell? And get everything else out of the way. Um, and color, I think color and typography are some, some of the big uh, stumbling blocks when people first start this. Um, and I think it's better to pull things away than to try to add stuff. One of, one of the things that strikes me as we talk about this is sort of like maybe the big data panel that's going to be coming up. Um, you're sort of limited only by the questions you ask and like how, the, the sorts of things you want to answer, right? So could you answer anything? Sure. What's much more important is like what should you be answering? Like Ben, can you talk to us about like how people think through that and, and maybe examples of, of, um, of, of why that's important? Sure. Um, could you bring up the, the basketball movie? Um, I think the, uh, you know, sort of echoing an, an earlier point, um, a lot of times what happens when looking, uh, when starting to work with data is that people tend to start with, uh, well, I have an enormous amount of information and how do I, you know, how do I present that or how do I visualize that? Um, and it's kind of exactly wrong in terms of what, you know, what you might actually use it for and how, um, how you actually put it into practice. So, um, this is a, so this is a, a bit of an anti-example. Um, uh, we did some work uh, sort of talking to the Stats LLC folks and the, uh, the Celtics actually, like looking at um, the uh, you know, camera tracking data for, uh, for players. This is just, you know, you take a game, uh, plot out the camera tracking information. Uh, you know, it's kind of cycling through a couple different ways of you know, showing the data to be able to see uh, the trails players make, trails that the ball uh, you know, goes through. Um, you know, who's actually on the court at any given time. This is kind of scrubbing through a little bit frenetically, um, sort of jumping to different parts of the game. We've got uh, plus minus across the top. But in general, and this is plus minus for each uh, player over the course of the game. So this is an interactive thing that uh, we're just kind of seeing a fast forwarded movie version of it. Um, the problem with this is essentially that we've taken the data and just put it out and said, you know, here's what the data looks like. But it, um, to do that without an actual you know, specific uh, audience, specific question in mind, specific story, um, really kind of uh, you know, hides some of the, more of the actual insights that you might actually want to get out of it. And so instead, um, typically what we try to do is start with, um, you know, we spend a great deal of time figuring out you know, who, who's the audience, what's the story, uh, what sort of context in, are they going to be using it in. So um, you know, as, as mentioned, it, it means one thing in terms of you know, what the what the GM needs to see versus a player versus a scout, um, and the, the modes that they're actually using, that one person's on an iPad, which is that uh, one person's using, making in-game decisions, uh, other people are you know, doing post-game, and there's a lot of different ways of slicing this stuff. Um, if you switch to the, uh, the Chelsea uh, example, um, so looking at something a little bit more applied, uh, 
this was ba uh, some work that we did with uh, Chelsea Football Club, basically looking at their training and recovery. And uh, they were doing a lot of work with you know, collecting data about players and how players were performing through, uh, through recovery. And so um, that previous, um, actually if we can just go back uh, to that previous image. So you know, they would have these uh, uh, PowerPoint decks of you know, a dozen different slides looking at different uh, angles of, of the data and sort of trying to um, tease out what was happening with these players. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is where we wound up to basically take you know, 12 uh, PowerPoint slides and put it into a single sheet that you could just read down uh, the list. On the left-hand side, we have the uh, time. So we're looking at a month's worth of data. We have uh, the triangles there that are basically saying, you know, uh, the player is favoring one, uh, one, one foot or the other. Um, you know, the other looking uh, sets of charts kind of looking at how, you know, the quality of their uh, workouts and how they're running. And so basically, this is something for the trainers. It's very, very specific. It's not going to go in, you know, it's not for a general audience, uh, but it answers all of the questions that um, that particular audience actually has and does it in a way that's very, uh, very compact and very direct that they can just kind of, you know, run down the lines. And so um, it doesn't take a full interactive thing. Sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, a printed thing that's really highly focused for the, uh, the domain in which it's going to actually be, uh, be used. So I would like to add something to that. In fact, possibly even disagree a little bit. Uh, I don't think you need a question to start looking at data. And I think there's often great value to just, you have data trying to see it in some way to see what it looks like. What is usually important, though, is that you have some sense of priorities. What is the important part of the data and what isn't? Uh, and I think the value from starting to look at it comes from two things. So first of all, I have this absolutely 100% guaranteed rule of when you know a visualization is useful or not in the early stages. And it is when you find a horrible error in your data that you didn't know existed. Every good visualization I've done, has this has happened early in the development process. So one thing I would say is just by that alone, visualization can be valuable. And also, if you are planning a visualization, start with the data rather than planning it for months and then only filling in the data at the end. The second thing is that often the data just looks very different than you would expect when you can see it all at once in ways that are hidden um, by aggregates. And this is a case where, you know, if you have a very precise question, you should just write a program or do an Excel formula to answer it. You know, don't, don't jump to visualization. But if there's any uncertainty, then seeing the shape of things can be informative. So let's take a look at uh, the wind map, if we could. So this was a, a personal project uh, that uh, a friend and I did, and we were interested in the wind over the US. Um, oh, this is a dramatic day, actually. It looks like this is showing what was happening uh, during, uh, I think, a recent hurricane, um, judging from that spiral on there. And the interesting thing is that we, um, in fact, if you want to see today's wind, you can just click on the upper left um, where it says wind map. And we can, oh, that's a, a previous one. But um, uh, anyway, so the interesting thing here is we were looking at data on the wind. Um, we were, just wanted to know what it looked like. I was skeptical this would be useful because I said, you know, I think the wind just basically goes from the west to the east, and there's not too much more complicated than that, but we stuck through it. We tried a couple of sources, discovered that some government sources have giant holes in the data because of satellite problems, but eventually found that, okay, there's one good source that was actually updated a lot. And it turns out to be extremely intricate in ways that I had never expected. Um, if you zoom in on this, for instance, uh, in the Rockies, you can see all sorts of, um, or you can actually even click on this map to zoom and it'll automatically do that. Uh, you can see all sorts of details showing the effects of the mountains in a way that were surprising. Uh, you can see like, you know, amazing stuff happening in the middle of the country. Often the wind is very, very fast. So it was fun from that point of view. But what was surprising to us is we put this out on the web and we got flooded by emails from people who were using it in ways we hadn't expected. You know, there are surfers using it. Bicyclists were thanking us. All, scientists, you know, were like studying butterfly migration using this. And we really had no idea going in that it could be useful for all of that. We just knew that the wind was in some sense important. And I think within an organization, you know, you can take the same approach sometimes. If you have data that you know is valuable, think of it as like data you would never let your competitor see, it can be worth doing, you know, what could seem like a semi-random exploration without a question, just to see what's in there. It, maybe this is bad form. If I can disagree with your disagreement. Uh, we're talking about like whether you need a question or not. We, we struggle with this still. Like, like if you give me something interactive, 
and, uh, and a whole bunch of data, like, yeah, I, I sort of can't get enough, right? I'd play around with it and try to find trends and dream things up, right? But um, so many of the people that I think we deal with that maybe aren't wired that way, um, they don't like that at all, right? First of all, they're overwhelmed by it. Second of all, uh, they don't know what questions to ask. Third of all, the quality of the questions they ask are not very good sometimes. Um, and so, like, we end up tailoring, I think, a lot more where we say, like, no, we're storytelling with this. Like, this is one chart, and it's really clear, and there's no junk on it at all, and, and you can't come to any other conclusion other than this is the right thing to do. So this is where I would divide into two stages. One is the exploration stage, and the other is the communication or possibly even advocacy where you have a point of view you're trying to make. Um, and I think that's you know, exactly the point, is that someone, if you are presenting someone to someone, it may be that the best stance to take is, yes, I had a question, I had a hypothesis, here's the result, and it leads inevitably to this conclusion, can you sign here, please? <laughs> Um, and there are times in life when that's the right thing. Guilty. But I think you should also consider yeah, that. I'm guilty of that. <laughs> exactly. As, as you uh, make your decision, there's a very different fluid mode um, going into it. But I think both of those cases are very, very you know, important to keep in mind. And it's also important as you design to think, OK, is this something that will overwhelm people? Or is this the point where I just remove all extraneous stuff so I can just get to the point right away? Joe, like, how does the Times think about that, doing something Whiz bang that everyone will retweet. That's interactive and cool. We like we like that part. You like that part yeah. versus um, versus something that like might sell newspapers. Yeah. yeah. Or, um, or like, if we still when care we about first, this, when we first when we yeah when we first uh, you could bring up Mariano when we first were doing a, we we're going to do a thing on uh, Mariano Rivera um, and our f initial response was we have all this we have all this pitch FX data and what if we made an interactive where Everybody could choose. Um, everybody could choose. You know, him against righties, him against lefties, him. You know, him in this particular count, all that kind of stuff. Well, you would get. A, you would. What we decided was we were really narrowing our uh, audience, maybe to the people that are in this room. But um, we decided that it was better for us to do the editing and us to do the storytelling and not let you, because then we would. Uh, reach a broader audience. And so we're starting to do more and more um, video graphics and less and less interactive graphics. And so um, what we had here was um, uh, a video that's about, I don't know, three or four minutes long. This was just a, a small part of, part of it. But it was every pitch that he threw in 2009. And um, if you, uh, I don't know, can you play that portion? Anyway, so um, it was every pitch he threw in, in 2009. But if you see it as a universe, it doesn't really make much sense. But if you see it, if you then, <laughs> and that doesn't make much sense. Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, we'll, we'll we blame, decided we decided is, to do the editing YouTube. for we'll you. We'll blame Martin for this. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's his fault. Yeah. So we decided to do the editing for you, and we decided to show you his pitches his cutters, his fastballs, his cutters to righty and his righties and his color, cutters to lefties, but in a narrative. We told a story with it. Um, uh, so this is, not, this is not the part of it, but that's okay. Um, this is this part, just, all right, so you're seeing, uh, that's okay. Anyway, um, we're doing less interactive stuff where you have total control over the data, and we are, we feel that our, um, our users um, want us to make some of the decisions for them. We've looked at the data, we know what it's like. Here is every pitch from 2009. <laughs> and if you let it go, basically it becomes a heat map. And then you, what you'll see is that the guy never throws the ball down the middle of the plate. And so he's got this, you know, we, we have, we have, there's some commentary on there from players and stuff like that. Um, talking about how he hits the, how well he hits the corners, he can put the ball wherever he wants. So we made the decision that that's the story we were going to tell, and we weren't going to really let everyone else tell their own story. We thought it was better to just tell the story ourselves, and it would open up a wider audience. Yes, yeah, same same tension there. We get we get that question all the time, like what 
what do you want me to know from this? What's the one thing I'm supposed to take away from this? And, and then I'll choose to agree or disagree based on, based on what you say, sometimes even more than the evidence, but what is it you want me to, to get versus being in a more exploratory way? And I think one of the things that kind of gets lost and you know, if we focus too much on the exploratory, like, I think it really does come back to an audience as far as, you know, so if, with this data, if you, uh, if the actual audience for this is scouts or it's, you know, people doing advanced work, uh, you know, people who are gonna uh, be dealing with those pitches coming at them, um, making this awful heat map in front of the plate uh, as they're trying to hit, um, that is a very different kind of tool that, and that might be an exploratory, uh, exploratory sort of thing. Um, or if it's, you know, the New York Times actually trying to engage an audience, it's, uh, it may be an interactive thing, or as you, know, you were mentioning, that like starting to move into doing more movies, that they can really package a tighter narrative, you know, that it's a lot, um, a bit more like writing in terms of, you, know, you actually have to have topic sentences and kind of take people, uh, people through the data a little bit. But um, these are very different, you know, very different roles that people are actually taking with the data. Um, and one of the dangers on the exploratory side is that um, usually, you know, like that sounds great. So usually when people uh, come and say they have an enormous amount of data, it's like, well, you can do exploration or you can do, you know, so the presentation of it, they're like, well, I want to do exploration. Everybody wants to do, wants it to be exploration because it's like their data is complicated and they want to look at it and they don't want to have to actually think about, you know, sort of focusing in on, you know, sort of narrow aspects of it or something that, um, and so there's a tendency to um, just sort of treat it as, you know, this biz, big massive information and talk about uh, big data and how many servers they have and things like that, that really kind of hides the, you know, deeper sort of meaning about, you know, why did you actually collect the data? Is it actually useful data? Is it actionable information? Um, you know, people don't get uh, fired for uh, collecting too much data, they, but if they leave something out, then, you know, that's more of a problem. And so there's a lot of forces like that in terms of you know, choosing the right data to actually collect and um, put together and, you know, which things you're actually going to explore in the first place. I actually think that leads into a really important point that I've uh, certainly seen uh, at all the data-driven organizations I've, I've worked in, which is that if you're making a decision, it's very rare that, you know, you just have to decide right now A or B. Often mm -hmm. there are other options. You might say, okay, I don't have enough information. If I only knew more about X, then I could make a decision. And so one of the patterns that's actually really common when you see sort of high-end dashboards for, for complicated, important decisions is a sense of uncertainty around all of the numbers. Uh, you have to know, okay, is this something I know for sure? Or is it like a very wide confidence interval and in fact maybe I should do more experiments or gather more data to understand that? And this is, I think is one of the big shortcomings of visualizations today um, that very seldom you know, do you see sort of beautiful illustrations of uncertainty? I mean, one of the things I actually like about um, this heat map is that it's, and, and when you have big aggregates of uh, historical information where you're not taking averages but showing everything, is it gives you a sense of likelihoods around things. And I think, you know, if you're really making an important decision around data, you should always have something that corresponds to a confidence interval. So you know, can I trust this data or do I need to gather more? Tell, tell us at Google, like, filled with engineers, like, how they think about this. Because I, I, even in our, even in my office, we'll, we'll have debates about, is this a cartoon to sort of help people understand, or, or can we sit with this and make a decision some other way? With, we'll use math and we'll get to something that's reasonable. Yeah, I mean, there are probably as many opinions as there are um, people at Google, I would say. But I think, you know, definitely it, some people, you know, are happy just to look at pure numbers. Um, I think what I found with visualization is very rarely does it let you make some totally different decision or open up a whole new world, but it can make things go much, much, much faster. And so that's usually the process by which visualization sort of becomes embedded in a decision-making process is when people realize, okay, I could look over this column of numbers and eyeball it to see whether it's going up like that or like that, or I could just look at a graph. Um, and I think what tends to sell visualization is the speed that it adds to the whole process. Um, so I, I would say that's you know, one of the big values that, that I see. Um, you know, I think at this point, you know, nobody is super suspicious of visualization as long as they can get back to the original data and sort of verify that things they've learned from the visualization really are true. So let's, let's change gears for a second. Um, one of the things this conference is about is feedback and sort of growing and learning for everyone. 
Um, one of the benefits I have of, of sitting uh, next door to the founder of the conference is we have access to the papers. And so we've uh, pulled lots of visualizations from this year's paper contest uh, for the gift of feedback today. So we'll pull up some of these uh, so we can look at and we'll have real experts sort of take a look at them and say, you know, here's this one like confuses me or this one doesn't make sense in this particular way. I'll start with this one. Um, this is a whole universe of data, and so when you see a whole universe of data, this is usually what you see. You see a lot of um, lines and dots, and maybe they're not showing you any real pattern. Um, universes so, all kind of look the same. Yeah, universes <laughs> look the same. So, um, the, the, so I'm not going to make a judgment based on, because this is probably just the universe, and you can go in and probably filter these things out. The one thing I will say, however, though, is that um, you've introduced a lot of... Um, noise into this, uh, even beyond your data. So I'm um, sure if you're in this room, you may have read um, Nate Silver's book. Um, and so what you really want to do is separate the signal from the noise. So you have a lot of signal, but you also have a lot of noise. And I'll, can you pull up uh, the PDF? Um, and I would just get rid of, if you're going to show this, I would just get rid of um, uh, the, the surrounding, the surrounding uh, courts and the surrounding people and all those things because they're all distracting, they're all noise, right? So if you take the same thing and you get rid of everything else around it, now you're focused in on just the data. And so I think mistakes a lot of people make early on is that they, they want it to look real or they want it to be sort of part of you know, reality or something, but it's really about the data, so try to get everything else out of the way. Yeah, I, I would say that um you know, I look at this and I say, okay, that is an excellent uh, first step, essentially. And then I think, okay, what else would you want to do? So ultimately, you are going to want make, to make decisions based on this. And so I'd start, I, here's where I'd return to the question of what is important? What outcome do I care about? And start allowing you to kind of make, to filter maybe, so maybe not all of those shots are equally important. Can you think of ways to highlight the ones that are or the ones that you don't, reduce the ones you aren't, don't care about? The other big question is, can you start making comparisons directly? Um, and that's one of the you know, points I'd say is, is critical with visualizations, is you often can get a picture that in itself is sort of useless, but the moment you compare it to another picture, and in fact make that comparison very explicit on the visualization, that's when you start to have insight. Um, and that's often the point where you can start to show to other people. You know, if, you, if you say, look, it looks like this, Someone who is a pure decision maker will say, so what? But if you can make a point where you say, if we started to do X, it would look different like that, and that's important because of Z, you have your story. I'd say let's, let's keep flipping through and look at some of the others as well. I think there are five or six here. This looks like, um, this looks like they have filtered it out and they came up with uh, some data, some very, some very quick um, uh, observations. Um, is that you're talking about a tennis court, but these right here are only the surface bo the service boxes, so it actually is not the entire court, and I don't think it's a quick enough read for that. So you might want to give a little bit more of the court to know that you're only talking about the service boxes, um, and I would probably get rid of the the grass stripes because you're also adding color and and noise and things like that. So I think I can't stress enough. <laughs> um, to edit yourself and to take out as much as you can because let the data do the talking, that's your point, that's your story. It's, it's, um, if you were writing a story and you had all this extraneous, these extraneous words in it, you know, an editor is gonna take them out, and so you need to be the editor when you're, doing the, um, when you're doing the visualization. It's not how much can I put in, it's how much can I take out. That's really, I think, a, a sort of important lesson to learn. So what I like about this is that there is a sense of importance, and I think that is really, really good. Um, what there isn't for me is a sense of uncertainty. You know, my eye, I, right now I can just see all sorts of patterns in this. I have no idea if those patterns are just, you know, Rorschach ink blots that I'm reading or real things. And so for this, you know, and this may happen in their paper or in their system, I would like to see many, many, many versions of these to compare and understand, like, is it a big deal that those three red important dots are all at the top? Or is that just sort of the random fluctuation if you put three things there an eighth of the time will end up in, in one quadrant. 
Um, so I think a sense of uncertainty is really is, is what is missing from this. And you could get at that by comparing with other things as well as just putting explicit confidence intervals. Let me take this one again. So I worked uh, with Kirk a little bit on one that we had done and um, at the Times. And uh, Kirk Goldsberry, um, uh, this is his paper. And um, so uh, I think this is really good. It's clean. It's, it, it gets right to the point. Um, it, shows the, uh, it shows Larry Sanders near the basket and how, much he, how, much, uh, how good his defense is compared to David Lee's. And um, I sort of think it's a, a really good, um, you know, it's just the data. It shows you what you want. It's a quick read. Can you go to um, the PDF uh, to be, remember the name, sorry. Uh, shot tendencies, I think. Um, so I did get some data from uh, Kirk, and um, we decided to uh, we decided to add some. This was uh, the, this was the heat against the thunder. Um, so in the at, at the top, it's uh, uh, it's the teams generally. Um, but if you go down, um, if you go down, we added we added one more layer. Go down a little bit more. Um, and we decided, well, okay, this is, this is the data we're showing you, and it's interesting, but, but is it different than everything else? So we put, in the, we put in the NBA average and whether it was better or, or worse than the NBA average, because um, then it could give you some context of, it's not just, you know, he was pretty good around the basket, he was pretty good from this part, this part of the three-point line. You know, in, these, in you know, medium accuracy, they were, they were both better than average. Um, and surprisingly, on um, three-point accuracy and the, and the bottom one, they were actually tied. So um, perhaps that's why they were in the final. But um, just uh, I think the, the data there is good. It's clean, and we, add a, we just add a little bit more um, texture to it. Any more out of that set? I don't remember if there are more. Uh, the set of uh, From the papers? Set of papers, yeah. There's just this one. Um, which I would just say it's a, it's a point I'm you're probably getting tired of me making, but um, is that there are drop shadows on the dots, and um, I just think it's I think it's it's unnecessary, and it's actually changing the color. Um, you're actually adding a gray to to the oranges and things, and I, I actually think you're changing your data that way. So um, I would take out the drop shadows on on the, all those dots because I don't think it's necessary, and I actually think it. It's changing the color, and you have a you have a key at the bottom right, and so those those colors are very meaningful. But now, if you add a drop shadow, you're actually changing that color. So I would just a small point, but I would just get rid of that. How does how does a team, whether it's on the uh, t team side where they're evaluating players and helping coaches, or on the on the business side with customers, like how do they think about? augmenting their staff or their resources with this like I suspect skeptics that came in today that that aren't a big fan of this field like they're not going to go out and hire a designer or a visualization expert but like how do you go from sort of not having this as part of your toolkit at all to something that that you could use semi-regularly I think people if you hire people who are interested in numbers this will happen almost organically um, you know I've seen at, at many companies, what happens is if there is a dedicated group of people who talk about numbers with each other, they will make actually very interesting visualizations. They will not nearly have the graphic sophistication of a New York Times visualization, um, but they will, they will actually be very, very good. Um, because the first precondition is people have to love their data. Um, and if they do that, and they really care about and understand it, they'll actually do quite good work. I think at some point, you know, there'll, a point may come when you need to hire a dedicated visualization specialist if you are certainly exposing anything to the public, like if you're creating things for fans, then you, know, you suddenly need to bring in the whole world of graphic design because you are competing with the New York Times of the world, and they're setting a very, very high standard. Um, and you know, certainly, I think there are people who, um, as data scientists, visualization is a key part of their toolkit. And for particularly complicated things, you, you may need them as well. But I would start by, you know, first bring in people who really know about numbers and love numbers, and that will get you at least 75% of the way there. Ben, how about you? Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I, 
We could actually show the uh, Wonderlic example just quickly. Um, one of the things that um, you know we, we've been talking at, uh, about, you know, so Joe's mentioned, you know, sort of removing as much as possible. Um, I think it, in general, it needn't actually be that uh, you make a very sophisticated, um, you know, graphic or something like that. You can actually, you know, make very uh, fairly interesting points with, you know, sort of uh, very basic graphics. So, uh, as an example. Um, I was curious about the, um, I'd heard about uh, Mario Manningham getting a, a six on the Wonderlic test, you know, so it's this intelligence test that they uh, take at the NFL Combine, um, and it was sort of fast, you know, six out of 50, uh, 25 is believed to be average, 20 or 25 is uh, average intelligence, whatever that means. Um, uh, and so, you know, starting with uh, the Wikipedia page actually had a um, list, you know, by position of you know, average Wonderlic scores for, uh, for different football players. Um, so the next slide, this is just an um, image from Wikipedia that is uh, you know, position by position, offense, uh, an offense and a defense for football. Um, for the next slide, this is just uh, doing some of this basic you know, uh, graphic design stuff, cleaning things up a bit. This is the stuff Tufty loves to talk about. Um, and just replacing all of those uh, the uh, text there with the actual scores for you know, people at each position. Um, if you go to the next, so we've got offense in blue and defense in red. Um, now just sizing each of these dots based on the, uh, you know, the actual Wonderlic score, for, the average Wonderlic score for that position. Uh, one of the fun things that starts popping out is basically the guys in the offensive line, you know, so the, um, the center and these guys on the outside, um, who are most in charge of keeping the quarterback from getting killed, um, are some of the smartest guys uh, on the field, and so um, whether that's actually a real uh, correlation or a you know an obvious thing, um, the bottom line is we went from this very basic you know sort of list of numbers in Wikipedia that you can kind of stare at a bit and kind of figure it out, and just putting that in context of where that is in the field, we can actually start you know getting a picture of what's uh, what's actually there, and then having uh, changed the sizes to the actual numbers, um, just replacing it back with the um, the position by position names. So here's the Loud, loud mouth receiver, Mario Manningham types out in the outsides with the wide receivers, they have the smallest dots. Um, and so, you know, clearly we could do this with better and more interesting data, but it's a very simple example of, you know, let's take a list of numbers and very quickly be able to get something, uh, you know, get some sort of insight out of it and be able to understand kind of what's there. And that's not a matter of, you know, hiring a whole staff of visualization experts, it's, you know, a couple of dots on a screen. Um, and I would add that if you're, if you're going to start to do some data visualization with your data, that if you have a, a design problem to solve, that somebody has probably solved it already. And um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Actually, these guys are pretty good at reinventing the wheel, but um, <laughs> uh, you don't need to go there. You don't need to, um, somebody has probably solved this problem before. If you could go to the um, cholera map. You, some of you um, may know this is a pretty famous map from the 1850s where there was a cholera outbreak in, in London and uh, a physician decided to map the people who had cholera and he found out that um, they were all surrounding uh, a water pump and that that water was uh, contaminated, right? So that was done in 1850. A couple of years ago, there was also a very good map in the Washington Post, if you could bring that up. Which is, the, which is pretty much the same map. And it's a very good map, um, which uh, shows a, um, a gun store and all the guns that have been, that's not the gun store, no, but. Not, not quite <clears throat> anyway, it shows the. Gun um, show. <laughs> it shows a gun store. And then all of the, all of the crimes around it um, that took place using guns bought at that gun store. And so um, it's pretty amazing. But basically, this guy, did a, this is a, an award, in, the, in print, this was an award-winning map. Um, he didn't have to reinvent the wheel. He could just go back to 1850 and use that map that the physician used, and it was the same kind of thing. But it was the, it was the data that made it interesting. And um, there's, there's all kinds of, um, you know, if you have a, prob a design problem to solve, somebody has probably solved one very similarly, and you could just go and steal it. And, and actually, just echoing that, I, th I think the, uh, one of the things, things that tends to be lost when talking about visualization is that um, just how little of it is actually new, you know, that so much of it is we're really kind of relying on hundreds of years of uh, cartography, 
Um, turns out like map makers are a lot better uh, in general than you know, us doing interactive graphics uh, at any given point. And you know, I think we'll get there in terms of how the interactive stuff works or how the uh, on-screen stuff, um, you know, how well that actually uh, communicates. But um, anybody can you know, pick, uh, pick up a road atlas and you know, generally figure out where they're going. And uh, we're, for a lot of the uh, online graphics, we're not even necessarily there yet. And so um, there's a great deal that we can learn from all of this you know, stuff that's been around for a couple hundred years. Um, as long as we can kind of get away from patting ourselves on the back for sort of the showy, flashy, you know, exciting stuff. So one thing I would say if, if you're interested in doing data visualization is that you should make sure the rest of your information technology people are on board with that and happy to work with, you know, they may be the people doing the visualization because it's a very iterative process. So I, I really loved in Ben's example of, um, you know, that he showed, if you could just go back to the, the last one, how he showed how he iterated on that. He went through a bunch of different versions and it just got better each time. And the interesting thing to me is if you look at it, you then can say, okay, suppose I had to make a decision about an actual player on this. You would need to know, okay, are those differences significant among those people on the front line? You know, if I have a player who's, you know, five points below that average, does that really matter? Or would that make them like the worst in that position by that criterion? And so there you would want to go back and get a whole lot more data. It might be hard to get that data involving a combination of either IT or reporting. And so you need, you know, everyone on the team needs to be on board with this fact that it's iterative and you'll constantly be exploring. And it's not like you're building, you know, this one system and it's done when it's done. But it's something that is a constant process of adding or subtracting, as the case may be. So you're, I'm hearing advocating stealing. That's good. <laughs> I, big, I, big we all do. We all do it. <laughs> okay. So where where would you point us? Like where should we be looking to steal from? <laughs> um, I, I mean, one of the beautiful things is that we're surrounded by great visualizations today. I don't know that this was true 20 years ago, but you know, obviously, you know, the times. You know, we have studios like Fathom doing wonderful work. Um, there are blogs online that you can read um, you know, that will at least show you a wide variety of work that you can. can tell, tell us about some of those, some of those blogs. Like yeah, where, I mean, where so go? for example, Flowing Data, you know, just to name one, is a, a great blog that has you know, very frequent updates. And if you just read that for a while, you'll start to see, OK, there are patterns here. You'll start to see comments of what people like, what they don't like. Um, getting some sense of what is working and what isn't is, is very helpful. So, one of the great things about the online world is people do comment and they're not shy about their opinions. So, so read those comments. Take them with a grain of salt, but read them. Flowing data, what else? Any, anywhere else you'd, you'd point us to look? Yeah, where do you if guys go? If you're hacks like us, we're looking for inspiration <laughs> most of the time, so. Um, well, in my industry, there are, uh, you know, uh, online news and, and newspapers, Washington Post, um, uh, there's a lot. They're they're doing a lot of data visualization, and so that's actually a good a good place to go is news sites, um, because reporters like to go into data and see if they can find stories in there. And so once they do, then the data comes to the uh, graphics people, and they like to uh, help prove their points. So. I do think finance is a really good area for yeah. people in sports to look at. That often, you know, either literally in the, in the news or if you can get access to systems that people use on Wall Street, there are a lot of analogies there. Good presentations end early. We have four minutes. We're done. Our panelists will hang around. Come say hello. Thanks.